Michael, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation with me. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Hi. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, so I'm a professor of philosophy at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Um, I've been for like a couple of decades. Um, I've written like uh, 70 academic articles in philosophy in um, you know different fields like uh, ethics, political philosophy, a small amount of metaphysics, and um, a lot of love of epistemology. Uh, I have like eight books, which you can find on Amazon, and everyone should immediately buy. And uh, uh, what else? I don't know. Uh, and, you know, people have uh, people have heard of me. They probably heard of my book, The Problem of Political Authority, which is my most popular one. Uh, there's also this one, Ethical Intuitionism, which uh, you know maybe we'll talk about. Cool. Yeah, my focus is definitely the moral topic. I think that. I'm a moral realist, so I believe that there is objective morality, but most people in the atheist community uh, at large are not. They think that it's moral subjectivist of some kind. Could you tell me some of the reasons to pri prefer moral objectivism, uh, moral realism, as opposed to the subjectivist view? Yeah, I mean, so there are different... Um, okay, so, you know, moral realism holds that there are objective values. Anti-realism is the view that there aren't any objective values. There are three versions of anti-realism and they're all bad. So, the, you know, the like the biggest reason for being a moral realist is that um, none of the versions of anti-realism is believable. Okay, so like what you mentioned was subjectivism. I, this might be the most popular, I'm not sure, but you know, the idea that um, moral truths depend upon observers' attitudes, right? So like murder is wrong is true because our society disapproves of murder or because I, the speaker, disapprove of murder, or something like that. Right? Okay, so what's wrong with this view? Um, so you know that implies that if society approves of something, then automatically it's right. So if you're in a society where uh, they approve of you know sending Jews to concentration camps, then on the on the relativist view, you should send Jews to concentration camps, right? If you're in that society, right? And uh, you know this seems like not true. Or you know if you think it's relative to the individual, then you have well, if I approve of torturing babies, then I should torture babies. And that just does not seem correct. <laughs> to put it mildly, that seems wrong. Um, and then you know okay, so like another another version of anti-realism is the non-cognitivist theory. So this basically says that moral statements are neither true nor false. So it's not that the truth depends on the observer's attitude. They're never true, but they're never false either because something like they don't really assert propositions. Because when you say something's wrong, you know, you're doing something like, you know, saying boo on that, right? just like expressing a negative emotion. Okay, what's wrong with this? Well, um, basically moral statements act like assertions of propositions in every way that you can think of, right? Like every linguistic test for whether a sentence counts as asserting a proposition, moral statements pass. Okay, so like a, a test would be you can embed it in the antecedent of a conditional. So you can say if P then Q, and in, in if P then Q, P has to be a proposition, right? And there are many other contexts that are like that, like, you know, I wonder whether, and I believe that, and it's not the case that all those things have to take a proposition, okay? And in every single context where you can put a proposition, you can also put a moral state. So it really looks like they are asserting propositions. And then, you know, if they're asserting propositions, it looks like they have to be true or false. And then, you know, if the truth doesn't depend upon observers, then it looks like it's objective. And the only, you know, the remaining form of anti-realism is nihilism, which says that moral statements are just always false. So, and the, the reason they would say that is, you know, the nihilists would have been convinced by the preceding arguments that moral statements are not statements about our attitude, and they, are also, they also are asserting propositions. So they're asserting propositions about alleged objective, you know, evaluative facts. And so the nihilists think there are no such facts, and so they say these statements are always false. And, you know, what's wrong with this? Um, you know, I think you shouldn't torture babies for fun. Um, and, okay, so the nihilist says, nope, false, you know. And so then, well, then I have to say, well, 
you know, you need to give me an argument for nihilism that is more plausible. Like, you need to give me premises that are more plausible than the premise that you shouldn't torture babies for fun, right? Because, you know, because you're denying that, right? Like, and, you know, it, I think it's more obvious that you shouldn't torture babies for fun than, you know, any philosophical premise that somebody's going to use to try to argue that there aren't any objective values. So a few things there. The first one is, is um, I think intuition is a pretty weak form of evidence. So like if someone says they see a leprechaun or whatever, and it can be directly apparent to them that they see a leprechaun, there's actually a condition, I forget what it's called, where you see miniature people. Oliver Sacks <laughs> talked about it. And so it can be direct, really apparent to them that they see these leprechauns. And so it's intuitively like really obvious to them that leprechauns exist. But I don't think that's strong evidence that we should believe in leprechauns because we know that the tool we're using to try to assess the truth of leprechauns is very broken. We know that our intuitions, our brains are not a reliable source of information in all contexts. And so I would wonder why in the case of morality, would it apply differently in the case of, than of leprechauns? It seems like because our intuitions aren't very good at giving us access to fundamental truths of reality, why should we accept it in this case as opposed to the leprechauns? Yeah, yeah. Well, so, I mean, first, you know, your example isn't an example of an intuition, it's an example of a sensory perception. Now, if you wanted to say, wait, so like they're having an apparent perception of the leprechauns, if you want to say, oh, so we can't trust perception, well, how do you know anything? Like, why, why do you think that there's a computer in front of you or <laughs> whatever? And by the way, you know, why, why do you think that that guy isn't seeing leprechauns? Why do you think there aren't any? And now, I think I know the answer is because you look and you see no leprechauns there, right? So like the rest of us look and see, okay. So what you could say is, well, if a lot of people perceive something, then that's probably true, okay? And before, you know, somebody comes up and starts like freaking out, I'm not saying that people seeing something makes it true. I'm saying probably, <laughs> you know, so, you know, you assume that things are the way they appear unless proven otherwise. But if one person is perceiving one thing and then like everyone else is perceiving it completely differently, chances are, you know, the one person probably made a mistake, not the million people. That's why you think that there aren't really the leprechauns because everybody else is seeing, you know, normal things there. <laughs> and, you know, by the way, like when you, when somebody sees a squirrel, you're like, oh, no problem right there. There's probably a squirrel. <laughs> um, that's because you've seen squirrels and everybody else has seen squirrels. Anyway, so apply this to ethics. So I'm, you know, just kind of saying the same thing about ethics. Like everybody else sees the wrongness of murder, and there's just like a handful of people, like psychopaths, who don't see it. They're probably the ones who are wrong. So why not think it's just like an evolutionary uh, disposition, something that was brought about simply to benefit survival or something kind of like an optical illusion it's something that was produced by our brains and doesn't correspond to reality so it wouldn't be yeah. true in which case the nihilist would be correct that they're all just false statements they're meant to correspond to reality but are simply false why think yeah. that they are actually true rather than just evolutionary byproducts yeah yeah so i mean you might wonder uh yeah i guess somebody in the chat is thinking i don't think his background is real yeah that's that's why it looks so weird you know <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it some quantum tunneling there on the side. Yeah, that's right. There's another universe behind me. Uh, I'm coming to you from the other universe. Um, anyway, uh, oh, okay. So, you know, maybe, yeah, our, our moral beliefs and adaptation that was selected by uh, the evolutionary process. Uh, no, it doesn't look that way. So, I mean, first of all, on the face of it, what would you expect? So, like, if our evaluative beliefs were chosen for, um, you know, promoting our own survival and reproduction or whatever, what evaluative beliefs would you expect us to have? I would, on the face of it, I would expect ethical egoism to be the dominant view. <laughs> Just, you know, procedures or, or modified version of it, like only me and my family and like people who are very closely genetically related to me or something. You expect something like that, but that's not our intuition at all, right? And, and, you know, a related thing to say is actually we've noticed how people's um, values have changed over the course of history. And so, uh, like, dramatically, right? People used to have very different values like 2,000 years ago, you know, let alone before that. And, uh, and it's not plausible that our genes have changed in that amount of time. 
And so now, you know, you have to explain, okay, so what are the adaptive moral beliefs? And if it was the beliefs from 2000 years ago, if they were adaptive, then you have to say that our current beliefs are not the product of evolution. They're the product of something else. Or if you say our current beliefs are adaptive, then how do you explain why people didn't have our current beliefs you know, 2000 years ago and for the rest of human history? Right. So I would probably argue that it's not the beliefs themselves that are the things that were selected by evolution, but some kind of predisposition to have a set of beliefs, which are moral beliefs. And then the particular ones that are the moral beliefs are a result of culture and other things. But I think that the disposition to have moral beliefs would likely be explainable by evolutionary tendencies. And you mentioned uh, ethical egoism. It's I've read a few studies that say that um, the closer someone is genetically to you, the more likely you are to feel empathy towards them. So, or the more yeah. likely you are to be charitable to them. And so like you're more charitable to brothers or sisters than second cousins or third cousins or something along those lines. And so it does seem like that that is a tendency that we do see in humans. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, and you know, that, I mean, in a way that shows the contrast between your instincts and, you know, your rational beliefs. Right. Do you do you believe that people who are genetically related to you are better or more important? <laughs> do you believe Typically that? Or do you just like feel more sympathy for them? And yeah, you feel more sympathy for them, but probably don't believe that they're actually like objectively morally more important or something, right? Sure. You know? and, I mean, so you know, like you'd raise the hypothesis that oh, maybe evolution designed us to have some moral beliefs. But it would seem like the survival value of this adaptation would depend upon the content of the moral beliefs. Like, so yeah, why would it select for having moral beliefs in general, but not any particular moral beliefs? Uh, it could be social cohesion value. So like you have some kind of a moral belief system that is tying the group together or something along the lines of like what religion does. It gives you some framework to act in a cohesive way with the group around you, which then could be beneficial in some ways. Um, yeah. But I, I did want to say that like, evolution does a lot of really weird and crazy things. Like we see lots of very strange things that evolution does all the time. So it doesn't seem like the most obvious thing would necessarily be what evolution would select for. So yeah. we, we would think like maybe evolution would select for everyone to have like gorilla level of strength or something. Um, yeah. but then, cause we think that's really, really strong or really, really advantageous. And then evolution does some really crazy things. Like it gives them off a 12 foot long tongue just to suck, um, pollen out of a orchid or something. Yeah, and it yeah. seems very strange to us, but it happens to work in that scenario. So even if we don't know necessarily yeah. why, um, this evolutionary belief worked, it doesn't seem like a stretch to say that it may have this advan advantage that we don't know about. Well, okay. But I mean, that's sort of like a thing that you could say about any belief. <laughs> I mean, it, right. It's, a, it's like, you're not claiming that you have specific evidence that there's anything wrong with our beliefs. You're just saying that it's possible that um, it was evolutionarily advantageous, which you could say about like literally anything about us. You could say maybe for some reason that I don't know it was advantageous. Right. And then, then I feel like, well, that doesn't really undermine uh, belief. Right. So my general, epistemological perspective is that we assume that things are the way they seem unless we have specific reasons for doubting it. You don't have to prove that things are the way they seem. If you have to prove that, then you're never going to prove anything. You're never going to get anywhere. <laughs> um, okay, so start. you start from where the way things seem, and then you change that if there are specific reasons for doubting it. Right, and so like I feel like to get specific reasons for doubting it, you need to have evidence that um, you know, like specific to your moral beliefs, that there's some other reason why you have them besides that they're the truth. You see what I mean? Right. So I, I would try to make like an analogy between other kinds of beliefs humans have that are faulty, like uh, uh, hunger or something, or um, sensations of color, or different different kinds of sensations or beliefs or intuitions humans have. They seem to be very. Uh, random or arbitrary based off of situational needs of what evolution wanted us to have. And so why not think evolution is also one of these things that doesn't correspond to reality, just a belief that we have, kind of like a God belief. Like a God belief could be very beneficial for evolutionary social cohesion. Uh, but I wouldn't say that simply because lots of people believe it, therefore it's likely to be true or therefore it's rational to believe it's true. But I'd say that morality 
would essentially be in the same category, saying that moral statements are true would have the same kind of a burden of proof as saying God exists is true. And simply because most people believe it would be an insufficient reason to justify belief in that kind of a claim. Well, I mean, like, you know, like if you have this sort of skeptical perspective, then why doesn't that apply to everything? You know, so like, oh, and, and that, now you have to prove that the external world exists and that you can trust your senses. And then, yeah, and so that, I, I would, I would just use to undermine itself because you're going to have no reason for believing in evolution in the first place. Sorry, well, I just use novel testable predictions. So I say, if I have a hypothesis and that hypothesis can make a prediction about something we don't know in the future and it can accurately um, make those predictions pretty consistently, then we have a reason to believe whatever the hypothesis happens to be. So like, I well, believe there's an external world. If there's an external world, then we'll discover things about the universe like stars, protons, things that we've never seen or discovered yet. And we discover them. So that's sufficient for me to believe there's an external well, world. And so in the case of morality, I'd say if we could say, make a prediction that we're going to discover some moral particle or something. And then we discovered it then. Yeah. I'd be granted. Yes. There is morality that's real for sure. I mean, I, I don't quite understand what you count as an accurate prediction, right? Because like, you know, like if the, you know, whatever burden of proof principle or whatever this is, if this applies to everything, then you're never going to know if any prediction is accurate. You know, cause you say like I predicted a and a turned out to be true. And then I go, why you're saying A is true. It's just your senses are telling you A is true, but we haven't proved that that's reliable in the first place, so. I mean, and, and, you know, like, so if you get to assume that sensory perception is correct until until you have a specific reason for doubting it, then why don't you get to assume that your intuitions are correct until you have a specific reason for doubting them? If you, if you do get to assume that, then, you know, I can make plenty of pre predictions <laughs> that will be, you know, verified by intuition, right? So, you know, like I think uh, torturing babies is wrong and this predicts that other people, when they see baby torture, are going to have a negative reaction to it. And that's true, you know, because they also see the wrongness of it. But it seems like the class of those predictions are sufficiently different. So like if I can make the prediction that if God exists, some people will have a disposition to believe in God, or most people have a disposition to believe in a God. Most people do have the disposition to believe in a God. Um, therefore, God exists or something along those lines. And that would seem to be the same kind of a prediction as the moral dr drowning babies or killing babies is wrong kind of a thing. But that would be, seems to be of a lesser level than say predicting that we'll see a a particular comet come around X number of years in the future and then see it or predicting that TikTok will be found in a particular kilometer space um, in yeah. one uh, place in Norway. I mean, yeah, but I mean, I'm still wondering how you know whether the comet came around. Yeah. You know, you're I, I'm that. happy with sense experience. So if I can predict my future sense experience, um, my imagination is very bad at predicting my future sense experience. And so if I have some model that can accurately predict my future sense experience, that model is more reasonable to believe corresponds to something than simply my imagination. Right. Okay. But I mean, when you do that, like I take it that you're assuming that the sense experience is theoretical. So like the brain in the vat scenario doesn't count. So the brain of that scenario explains your sensory experiences as experiences, but it doesn't explain the facts, uh, the physical facts that you seem to be observing. I'd so say I, it would be like contingent on the individual. If, if the individual has a hypothesis, I'm in a brain in the vat, and there's some programmer and he's programming it such that we're going to see a meteor come around in 527 years and the meteor comes, then I'd say that person X would be justified in believing they're a brain in the vat. Um, if I say, I believe I'm in an external world and governed by gravity and in gravity, it's pulling the meteor and it's going to be around in 527 years, then I would be justified in believing there's an external world. So I think that if anybody has a particular hypothesis that can accurately predict future sense experience and it works for them successfully to some degree, then I think they're rational to believe it. Same with like God. If, if someone yeah, believed in well, a God and they said, if I pray to God, he gives me a gold brick and a gold brick appears, then they're rational to believe in the God. Yeah. Well, right. But I mean, would you be justified in thinking you got your brain in a vat right now? Um, if I genuinely thought that was a hypothesis that could make predictions and successfully, then I think I believe my brain would be justified. I think that would count as a justified belief.
uh, okay. And uh, brain of the bat hypothesis makes the same predictions as the real world hypothesis, right? Uh, so, yes, sort of. So we should think we're brains and bats right now? Well, if a person believed that to be a reasonable hypothesis that actually did make these predictions, well, then they would be... Right. It can't, it can't be dependent on whether you believe that it's reasonable, right? We're asking whether it actually is, in fact, reasonable. Like, it, it can't be that the reason it's not reasonable is that you just decided that you don't think that it is. Well, I think it's more luck. I think it's more like um, epistemic luck, where I was lucky enough to fall into this belief system of external world realism, and this system yeah. of external world realism make successful predictions. If someone else fell into the belief or was brought up in the culture of the brain and the vat culture, they would be equally as justified in believing that belief because it makes the same predictions, but I wasn't brought up in that culture. And so I don't have that belief. And so, oh, okay. well, but I mean, I, I don't think that what, what you're justified in believing could be that contingent, right? Like, so it's just a matter of luck. So, I mean, if you know that there's another theory that's equally good, even if it wasn't the first one you thought of, then you should like, you know, give up your current view, right? Like, you know, what if a scientist were to take this approach and, you know, like they have a theory to explain some evidence and then somebody else comes up with another theory and the first scientist goes, well, that was, that's not my theory. So, you know, like you go on believing that, but I'm not going to believe it because it wasn't the first thing that I thought of. Like, you know, no, that's, that doesn't matter. What matters is whether the new theory actually explains the evidence. So. I wouldn't say that. I'd say that if... I have a theory or some tool that I use and I have success with using that tool and some other tool comes along and can do everything exactly the same as my tool. It just has a different color or whatever, then that's fine. He can use his tool, but I'm, I'm still justified in using my tool. Sure. Yeah. But I mean, the difference here is that, you know, beliefs are making claims and in this case claims that are logically incompatible with each other and we care what the truth is. Now, if you only, if you have a purely like pragmatic instrumentalist, um, what perspective, like, you know, that, that we're not trying to find out the truth. We're just trying to like, you know, get some practical results then yeah, maybe you could say, you know, yeah, and, and the only results that you care about are like, you know, your results on your own experience, then yeah, you don't care whether the brain of that or the real world is true. Right. But, um, but if we care about what's true in objective reality, then like, you know, one of the tools is wrong. Um, oh yeah, sure. But I think that because of underdetermination, we could never know with certainty which one is right and which one is wrong. And so I think that if you have a particular viewpoint, you're justified in believing that that's objectively true and the other one's objectively false, um, simply because you've used it and you've had success with it. And it doesn't matter if another person used a different tool and had success with a different tool, there would be equally as justified to believe their tool works. But because you had a particular tool and you have used it your, entol your entire life and have had success, inductive success using it in the past, I think that gives you justification to say my tool is correct um, and their tool is wrong, essentially, even uh, though they make the same predictions. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't seem justify but anyway okay but <laughs> like uh, well I'll, I'll just like assert you know just assert but i think like no i don't think the brain of that hypothesis is rational on our evidence and i don't think even if somebody believed it you know if somebody grew up believing it i don't think that would make it rational uh and so i i think that you know what we do is we assume that things are the way they appear and the, the brain of the vat hypothesis is not consistent with the way things appear as it, sa it says that the appearances are radically deceptive, and there's no reason for saying that. So that is because the brain of that scenario contradicts the way things appear to us, you need specific reasons for favoring that in order to give up the real world hypothesis, which is consistent with where everything is. Okay, so like that's, that's my view about that. Um, when you think about morality, like, okay, well, let's just start with the way things seem. Which is that, like, it seems wrong to uh, commit murder, it seems wrong to torture babies, whatever. All those things just seem wrecked. We should only give that up if we have specific reasons for giving it up. Like, somebody needs to give, you know, an argument about why that is not like a good coherent view to maintain. Right? 
wouldn't that lead to the consequence of every one of our initial um, seemings happens to be justified as we initially seem it? So like it initially seemed to be the case that Zeus created lightning or it initially seemed to be the case that there are spirits and demons who do things in the world, all wind, tornadoes, echo. Uh, it's Human have this tendency to initially perceive things a certain way that tends to be false in many, many cases. But under that epistemology, it seems like each one of those seemings would be initially justified until a defeater was presented. Oh, yeah. So, you know, yeah. Does that apply to all seemings? Yes. So <laughs> everything that initially seems to be the case is prima facie justified until you have a reason for doubting it. Now, uh, I'm not really sure in what sense it seemed that Zeus was doing anything. Like, nobody claimed to have seen him, did they? Or if somebody did claim to have seen them, they were he was, they were just simply lying, right? Like, it wasn't probably, unless they actually had a hallucination. Maybe if somebody had a hallucination of Zeus, then yeah, they had kind of facial justification for believing that. Right? Of course, we don't right now have that. But, you know, and, and like, you know, you tend to think that some, some belief is unjustified because you're not justified believing it now, but really, like, you know, how is that different from the rest of your current beliefs? Uh, if you actually thought that, or, you know, like a, a good contemporary example is people who have religious experiences. And like, when they have these experiences, I take it, and I've not had one of these experiences, but anyway, I take it that they feel as if they are perceiving God, you know, in some pretty direct way. And then, so if you have that experience, like it would be rational for you to think that you are perceiving God, unless there's some specific reason to doubt that. Right? And then, you know, us who don't have those experiences are all skeptical and like we like we want to think, oh, maybe you're unjustified. But really, like, how is that different from everything that I experience normally? And I assume that those things are real, right? It seems like there's a scope limitation. Like it seems like what you're seeming to be the case becomes less plausible as the scope increases. So like I think I'm seeing an all-powerful being who created the universe and was outside of space time seems to be have a much higher burden of proof than say I saw a dog or I seem to have seen a dog or whatever. Um, and so the kinds of justification that would be required for those larger claims, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And so simply if a claim is of that large enough scope, it seems to be a good enough reason to doubt it because it has that large scope. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, so, you know, if you seem to see a dog, that's more credible than if you seem to see God. <laughs> Why is that? But, I mean, that does have to do with the rest of our belief system. So, um, you know, uh, appearances and beliefs that fit together tend to support each other. And so what happens is, well, there have been many occasions on which people saw dogs. There are many occasions on which you see a dog and also other people see dogs. And so, like, there are all of these different appearances that all fit together, you know, with the whole story where dogs exist. Okay, and then, well, there are some people who um, seem to perceive God. They don't perceive it at the same time, and they don't perceive God in the same way. And then there are a bunch of people who don't perceive God at all. And then there are, like, these arguments about, you know, arguments about the existence of God, which sort of, you know, provide other evidence, maybe evidence against, right? So, you know, the the sense, the religious experience provides prima facie justification, but it's less supported by the rest of your belief system, right? The rest of your belief system is all based upon the way things seem to you, right? It's just that, like, it's not like that the dog perceptions are supported in a different way. It's just that they fit together with the, the rest of the appearances better. And how would that apply to the case of morality? Why wouldn't morality um, also be doubted for the the outside reasons? Because I have many friends who are anti-realists who say, it seems like um, this could just be a product of evolution. So why aren't they as justified in doubting evolution or doubting morality as being real as you and I are in doubting that God is real for the same reason that it doesn't seem to fit our background knowledge of the world? Because it doesn't like... <laughs> doesn't seem like morality could be like a particle or a wave or anything. It seems like the fundamental nature of reality is particle and waves. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I should say, like, um, you know, like, I don't know whether there's a creator or not. And like, so, like, I, like I'm not saying that, that that's not true. I'm just saying, like, I haven't perceived it or whatever. So, um, okay. But, and by the way, like, it, 
how plausible it is depends upon exactly how you're defining God. So, like, I have arguments that it's impossible to be um, all powerful. Okay, but if it's just a very powerful creator, then that's possible. Also, though, I don't think a religious experiences could reveal all of the things that are said in traditional theology, right? So, like that, you know, that he's all powerful. I don't, I don't see how you could have an experience as of somebody being all powerful. <laughs> So anyway, and also, you know, like, well, you didn't observe and create the universe and like whatever, all these, it, certainly you can't observe somebody being outside time. If you have an experience of something communicating with you, then you're experiencing it in time. Anyway, okay. So, <laughs> so okay. And then, you know, what about um, our moral beliefs? Well, like if, you're, if your friends actually don't have ethical intuitions, then, um, you know, like then it's more understandable that they would doubt that there is morality. Um, but if they have moral intuitions, but they've just like adopted a skeptical theory about them, that's a, that's another matter. Then they need to tell you why they have that theory, right? Like a theory needs some justification. And like if the theory doesn't fit with most of the things that seem true to us, you know, it's not a good theory, right? But, you know, and I think there are some people who don't have moral intuitions. Like I think um, psychopaths don't have moral intuitions. Right, but to me, the best explanation is that there's something wrong with them, rather than that there's something wrong with the other 97 or 99 percent of the population. Right. Sure. So I would say that the analogy that I would bring would be like when someone says they have an experience of an all-powerful being. It seems like a category, or how do you experience an all-powerful being? How do you experience something outside of space time? It seems like there's a contradiction between the experience and the thing you're claiming to experience. And many of the non-cognitives would say the same thing about morality. It says we have, we have experienced these moral intuitions, but that, and they're, they're true. These are true moral intuitions that are true about the world, but they say, well, true in virtue of what, how could they possibly be true? It doesn't seem to make sense that they could be true in the first place or yeah. what could possibly make them true. And so in the same way that we can doubt someone had an experience of an all powerful being or a being outside of space time, we could doubt that someone had a moral experience for the same reason. Cause it seems like there's a category error there. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess that among anti-realists, I guess that um, there's a fair number who think that, basically think that morality is counterintuitive. Like they have moral intuitions, but they think that the general proposition that there are moral facts is counterintuitive. And um, and I don't find it counterintuitive at all. I find it intuitively obvious. So I guess what I have to say is, you know, like, well, we need to get some theory about what has gone wrong. Okay, like, you know, one of, something went wrong with one of us, all right? But let me say, the overwhelming, it appears that the overwhelming majority of people throughout history were moral realists, including, you know, not just dumb people, but including the smartest people, including like the leading philosophers of the time for most of human history. And by the way, today, most professional philosophers are still moral realists. And so if you think moral realism is counterintuitive, that's, um, there's something gone wrong there probably with you, right? It doesn't appear that something that almost everyone has believed throughout history, including both ordinary people and the experts, it doesn't seem like that is, could be counterintuitive, right? And then and they're like, oh, you know, what could possibly make it true? What do you mean? What could possibly make it true that it's wrong to torture babies? The wrongness of torturing babies, that's what could make it true. Like, I don't even understand what they're talking about. <laughs> like, you know, what's the mystery about this? It's just the wrongness of it. And like, well, they won't, you know, the anti-realist wants me to say what wrongness is, right? But it's not anything else, right? Wrongness isn't anything else other than wrongness. Or, you know, like I could explain it using other evaluative language like you know, property of being such that it ought not to be done right? <laughs> or you know, whatever. Maybe, maybe it could be explained in terms of value, like it's decreasing the value of the world or something like that. Only if you accept consequentialism, of course, but you know, it might be able to be explained in other evaluative terms, but I don't think it could be explained in non-evaluative terms, but I don't think that that's a problem. So like if you were trying to make an analogy of how um, moral statements relate to particle or factual statements because you're saying moral statements are true kind of like the moon is 255,000 miles away is a factually true statement. How could you 
what we say like in virtue of what it's true, we say, well, in virtue of the fact that it corresponds to reality. So we can say the moon is 255,000 miles away. That corresponds to reality. Therefore it's true. Um, what is it in reality that exists for morality to correspond to? Is there like a uh, rightness or wrongness abstract thing that just exists? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, so, um, what is it that, okay. So what, what's said to correspond is, a statement or a belief with a fact. So there's like the statement murder is wrong. And what does that correspond to? It corresponds to the wrongness of murder. That's it. Like just the fact that it's wrong. Right. And, uh, you know, when somebody says, Hey, you know, the moon is 250,000 miles away or whatever it is, I don't know. Um, what does that correspond to? Well, it corresponds to the fact that the moon is 250,000 miles away. Right. <laughs> like, and, you know, and that, that's, you know, that's how the correspondence works for, you know, for all cases. Uh, and like the only reason why this seems like a sharp question is that the person is presupposing that it's wrong to murder babies isn't a fact, right? But you know, so if that's not a fact, then I didn't tell you what fact it corresponds to. But if it is a fact, then I did tell you what fact it corresponds to. So you know, like, what's your problem? Well, I think the question is more: how does, how or where does that fact exist? What kind of ontology does that fact have because like yeah. the fact that the moon is two hundred fifty-five thousand miles away it's a physical fact we can measure it we can observe it um how yeah, yeah. in what way does the moral fact exist because it seems to not be yeah, in a yeah. physical way yeah yes yeah, it's not a physical fact i mean there's some dispute in uh meta ethics about you know whether moral facts are natural facts or not anyway i would say yeah th no it's not a physical and it's not a natural fact um You know, like you could say some things about the moral properties, like that maybe the, the fundamental moral facts are, they're kind of abstract truths about the relationships between properties. So like um, the reason why a particular action is wrong, it doesn't just like have the wrongness basically fundamentally. A particular action is wrong because it has certain descriptive features, non-moral features, and those non-moral features are quote wrong-making features. So that, like a fundamental moral truth is like, um, you know, causing pain for no reason is a bad feature or something like that, right? So, and you know, the causing pain for no reason, like that's a general feature that actions could have. And then, and wrongness is another, you know, abstract property. And there's a relationship between those two properties, right? You know, that's like one of them generates the other one. And so that's like a abstract necessary truth which you can um, apprehend just by thinking about it. If you think about it intellectually, you're going to see like the badness of the causing pain for no reason feature. I wanted to ask about that too. You said the properties that make something moral or immoral. Um, there's a, there's a, I like to ask the Euthyphro dilemma when it comes to oughtness. Is something moral because you ought to do it or ought you do it because it's moral? How, how would you answer that? Uh, as far as I can tell, those are the same thing. So neither i guess neither or both i mean so like the because in the sense of explaining the meaning of the word could go either way like if somebody doesn't know what moral means then you could say well what makes something moral is that you ought to do it or if they don't know what ought means then you could say but it makes it the thing you ought to do is that it's moral um, the way i under i understand it is that the first horn is something moral because you ought to do it oughtness is itself some one of the core features the core properties of what morality is and the second horn is um ought you do it because it's moral that means there is some set of facts that make something moral and oughtness is just an additional irrelevant fact so once we know what something moral is once we have the collection of all the facts of what makes something moral then we apply this like hypothetical imperative to it so i understand the first horn to be oughtness is like inside or a part of morality and the second horn to be oughtness yeah. is separate from morality Okay. Yes. No. So I guess I think that the, well, the, there are fundamental moral properties and less fundamental ones. And so the fundamental ones include things about um, good and bad and also things about reasons for action. Um, and so, and then when you say that something ought to be done, then you're saying something about the reasons for doing this, like the reasons for doing it outweigh the reasons against it. There are different kinds of reasons. So there are moral reasons and there are prudential reasons and I don't know, maybe epistemic reasons or whatever. Okay, different kinds of reasons. Um, and when you say that something is moral, you're saying that there's a certain kind of reason for it, a certain kind of practical reason. Um, 
And that's a reason that is non-self-interested and categorical, right, and objective. And so, um, right, so like if you have a self-interested reason, okay, so that's a prudential reason. So then like you prudentially ought to do the thing. Um, and then, you know, there's like an instrumental reason. If you just want some goal and this action will get it, then you have a reason to do that. Okay, but the moral reason is when you have a reason that doesn't depend upon your desires or your interests, or, and also doesn't depend on, you know, your, whether you believe that you ought to do it or not or something like that, then that counts as a moral reason, right? So then that's, that's supposed to explain what moral means or what morality consists of or something. Okay. Uh, and what is your view on moral naturalism? Do you think morality could exist as some kind of a physical thing that we just don't understand yet? Uh, no. Uh, well, so... You know, like there's two versions of this, right? There's a version where you try to define moral terms, and so you claim that you can explain the meaning of good or the meaning of right uh, using non-evaluative terms. And so I think that just doesn't work. Right? So, you, um, you know, like if you're a utilitarian, like you might be tempted to say maybe good just means causes pleasure, and uh, and maybe right just means you know maximizes the good or something like that. Okay, but in you know, GE Moore kind of refuted this, right? So. You, know, you think about something like, okay, is it? You ask the question, is it good to cause pleasure? And what you're supposed to see when you think about that question is simply that, like, that's an intelligible question, and it does not mean does causing pleasure cause pleasure. So that shows that is good doesn't mean causes pleasure. And so I and I think something like this just works with any attempt to define good. Um, there is this, you know, there's this other approach where they they say, the naturalists say, yeah, okay, so we're not actually explaining the meaning, but we are still explaining the nature of the thing. And then to explain what they're talking about, they give analogies, you know, like you can explain the nature of water. It's a compound of hydrogen and oxygen. That is not an ex explanation of the meaning of the word. It's not built into the meaning of the word water that's a compound of hydrogen and oxygen, which is why for millennia people thought it was an element. And it's not that they didn't understand the word <laughs> um, when they thought it was an element. Okay, anyway, so, but that is a correct account of the underlying nature of water. So maybe there's something like that with goodness, okay. So, like, on the face of it, I think that's more promising. But um, I just, like, don't think that any theory of that kind is justified. Like, I don't think that you can give any kind of reasoning for such a theory that's at all like the reasoning for the water equals H2O theory. Like the water is equals H2O theory. I don't know if philosophers know, but I know why we believe that. There are specific experiments where you can take hydrogen and oxygen gas and turn it into water. There's another one where you can take water and turn it into hydrogen and oxygen. <laughs> there's nothing like that for a naturalistic account of good, right? Where there's like some crucial experiment that you can't explain if you don't think goodness is causing pleasure or whatever, right? So anyway, yeah, like, so like I don't have a proof that such a theory can't be true, but I don't see a justification for it. Uh, what would you, if we maximized morality, what would you think the world would look like? What would be the best of all possible worlds if you think morality was maximized? Wow. Okay. Uh, so like everybody would be as moral as possible. Uh, I don't know. I guess like, you know, we would all be, we would all be helping each other, not hurting each other. And, and by the way, there would be no government and nobody would complain because we don't need a government. If there, are no, there are no criminals and there are no threats from anyone. So it would be good. Uh -huh. And then, you know, and like we, we're all, you know, we all want the good, so we would like all correctly prioritize. And so we wouldn't be like spending a bunch of money on unimportant things and neglecting more important things. So we'd probably just get like a whole bunch of problems solved, right? You know, like, um, like, I mean, a big reason why we're not solving big problems is sort of, uh, well, selfishness and incorrect prioritization and like people just being emotional. And so if, we, if you're maximally moral, then you won't let your emotions interfere with, you know, deciding what to, with doing the right thing, right? With deciding rationally what to do. And so then, you know, we're just like, okay, so we probably cure aging, you know, because that's obviously one of the biggest problems. Uh, obviously, you know, we would stop, uh, we stop eating other animals for fun. And, um, you know, we like, uh, <laughs> and that, and, you know, that would decrease the amount of suffering in the world by, you know, 99, well, preventable 
you know, preventable by human suffering would decrease by over 99% or whatever like that. So it'd be much better, right? Yeah. Well, the reason I ask is because I have a question about like natural evil. So in, in the Bible, in Christianity, there's these natural evils, tornadoes, earthquakes, et cetera, et cetera. And to me, it seems strange to not include those in the concept of morality. It seems like as we progress in our understanding of humanity, that we're determined creatures to some extent and biologically by our brains, it seems like the difference between, say, the for the Texas shooter who had a... Uh, the say a thing in his brain who wasn't able to consciously do these things he was under the influence of a tumor uh is more akin to like a rock falling on somebody or something and so how do natural evils play a role in your view of morality are there such a thing as natural evils would the world be more moral if there were no tornadoes oh uh, i mean there are the things that people call natural evils it's a bit of a I would say a, uh, an unusual use of the word evil, right? Like, like it's sort of a technical use of the word evil by philosophers of religion, right? They don't really mean evils in that sense. They just mean bad things. So yes, there are bad things that happen in nature. Although if there is a God, then you could say, no, it actually is evil on God's part for <laughs> that he allows those things to happen, right? Because if I could stop, like, if I could stop a, a hurricane that was gonna kill a hundred people, and I just go, nah, you know, feel like doing it. <laughs> like, then I'm a bad person. So anyway, um, yeah, but I mean, like if there's no God and there's nobody who can stop all these things, then it's not really evil because um, I take it that the word evil in the ordinary sense um, implies like some, some amount of blameworthiness, right? For me, that causes like a, an emotional dissonance because I think that thinking that a morally perfect world would be less good than like a, perfectly good world or something along those lines seems strange the way that's phrased seems strange to me it seems like a morally perfect world would have to like entail all of the good things oh i see uh yeah i mean i i think that might just be a sort of like puzzle about the use of morally perfect and so um like perfect with respect to all moral values oh okay yeah then there would have to be no natural evils right but if you just mean morally perfect, like every um, agent is maximally moral, then yeah, okay, there could be natural evils that aren't anyone's fault. Right? Do you think that uh, we would one day probably start to use the term morality to refer to more of the including the natural evils thing? Because it seems like as we realize humans are more determined and, and there's not really a free will in the libertarian sense, that we are closer to the rocks falling on people and not as blameworthy? Oh, I guess. I mean, I don't uh, don't think that's true. <laughs> but some, some people think that's true. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think we are blameworthy and we do control our actions. Uh, if, if we don't, well, you know, if I came to believe, so, you know, I believe in libertarian free will, but if I came to believe determinism, then the first thing that would happen is I would become a compatibilist. And only if compatibilism was more soundly refuted than it has been so far, only then would I become a hard determinist. And then at that point, I suppose I would think that nobody's responsible for anything. Okay, but then, like, then I think, you know, it would follow that there is no reasons for action, no reason for anyone to do anything. Because, you know, you can't have a reason to do something unless you have a choice about whether you do it. And so, Right? And so then, you know, you start to say things like, hey, you know, maybe we shouldn't punish people for committing crimes because they didn't really have any control. Oh, well, if that's true, then you don't have any control over whether you punish them. So you can't be blamed for punishing them either. So <laughs> there's no reason not to punish them. There's no reason to punish them. There's no reason, just no reason to do anything. So, you know, and also there's no reason to stop saying that there's a reason to do these things. Right? It's like... So we'll just throw our hands up. I don't know. Uh, you mentioned compatibilism versus determinism. What is the difference between those two? Because from my view, compatibilism is just rebranding the kind of determinism. Yeah, I mean, you know, some people call it soft determinism versus hard determinism. Right? So, like the soft determinists think, oh yeah, everything is determined, but we still have free will. And the hard determinists think, you know, everything is determined and that means we have no free will. And like most, 
most people like when they first hear about the free will issue, like compatibilism is one position that they wouldn't think of, and that just sound, sounds contradictory. So if it didn't sound contradictory to you, you did not understand what I said. <laughs> so they're saying everything is completely predetermined, and we still have a choice about what we do. <laughs> anyway, okay. And like, how does that even, how is that a position? And actually, it, I think it's the dominant position in the history of philosophy, right? uh, at least in the Western tradition. Um, and like, how is that a sensible position? Well, like they start trying to analyze what free will means. And, you know, okay, part of free will, part of having free will is like, you have to be able to have done something otherwise than what you did. You have to have multiple options available to you. They're like, okay, so it sounds like you don't have that under determinism. But then they're like, no, no, you have to, analyze what it means to have an option available like what it means to say that you can do something like here's one account to say that you can do something means that if you try to do it you would succeed okay and notice that that is compatible that's logically compatible with it being the case that you were determined not to do it because part of the way you were determined not to do it was that you didn't want to do it Okay. And so that's so that's and that's why you didn't do it. But if you had wanted to and you tried to, then you would have succeeded. So like you didn't do it, but you could have done it is consistent. Of course, that's only assuming that's a correct analysis of can, which you know there are objections to. But another thing they say is uh, you know, to not um to have free will is to have your actions determined by internal causes as opposed to external causes. When you lack freedom, that's when there's some like external person or force or whatever that's constraining you from doing what you want to do. So it's not like the distinction on their view isn't between whether there is a cause or not. It's between what kind of cause. It's between having internal and external causes, right? Like, why would you think that? Uh, I mean, you know, there's this like dialogue that the philosopher, the compatibilist W.T. Stace put in one of his books, where he's like, he imagines you talking to someone and they go, you know, I once went without food for a week. And you go, did you do that of your own free will? The person says, no, I did it because I was lost in the desert and I couldn't find any food. Okay, and then you know, you have a conversation with Mahatma Gandhi and he says, I once went without food for a week. And you go, did you do that of your own free will? And he says, yes, I did it because I wanted to compel the British government to give India independence. Because, you know, we went on hunger strikes during the protest of colonialism. Um, and, the, and what you're supposed to notice is both of those dialogues are natural. Like, it doesn't appear that anyone was misusing language. And so it looks like they're using the phrase of your own free will in the normal English sense. And notice that what they say in the first case is it wasn't of my own free will. And then they explain why they did the thing by citing external factors. In the second case, they say it was of my own free will. And then they explain the action by citing an internal factor, like a person's desire or values or whatever. Right? And so then that, that lends some credibility to this thesis that you know, having free will isn't being undetermined. It's being partly determined by your own sort of beliefs, desires, and values. But well, could you say that those beliefs, desires, and values were caused by an external thing prior to your birth? Um, yeah, they, right. They, they would have been right. But so what? <laughs> right. Like that, you know, like like on the compatibilist view, that's irrelevant, right? It's because you know, freedom just means something that I. It's something in the neighborhood of being able to do what you want, and uh, you can do what you want, and. That's not changed by the fact that your desires were caused by something before your birth. And it's still true that you can do what you want. Awesome. Well, we've been going for about an hour. I really appreciate you coming on. It was a really pleasant conversation. Would you like to give a shout out to where people can find your books and your other bright works? Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, well, you know, I have an Amazon page and also I have, um, I have a personal web page, owl232.net. It's like the word owl followed by the number 232.net. And then, and then I have a sub stack. Um, blog. It's uh, fake news, F A K E N O U S dot substack dot com. And, uh, you know, I have my philosophical thoughts there every week. Awesome. Thanks again for coming on. I really appreciate it. And I will let you go. Great. Uh, thanks for having me. Awesome. Have a nice day.